Mm -hmm. Some of my voice gets picked up by the mic. Oh. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so uh, we are happy to welcome uh, Helvi Witek here today. She's going to uh, talk to us about how I can't open my phone. She's going to talk to us about uh, investigating fundamental physics using gravitational waves. Um, and she is definitely an uh, expert on gravitational wave physics, particularly from a numerical uh, relativity standpoint. Uh, but I should say she's not just a numerical person. She's also capable of talking to formal theorists like me. Uh, so I actually met her at a summer program that uh, is driven by the formal theory community. Uh, and because she does things that are of relevance to LIGO, she can talk to experimentalists too. So she should be able to talk across the full background. Um, and then uh, her PhD came from Lisbon. Uh, and after Lisbon, she was at uh, postdocs at Cambridge and Nottingham, and then she was a Marie Curie Fellow in Barcelona uh, and a Royal Society Fellow in London, and now has joined UIUC, uh, which is obviously a little closer to us, so we were able to bring her here for a talk, so we're all very much looking forward to it. Okay, thank you so much, Cindy, and thank you all for coming this afternoon and having me here to tell you about gravitational waves and the questions in physics and fundamental physics that they can answer using gravitational waves. What I brought you here, and it's, oh, light, yes, thank you. Um, so what I brought you here, and you can already see it in the background, is an image of the very first gravitational wave detection. Gravitational waves are essentially ripples, deformations in the very fabric of space-time that are generated when compact, massive objects like black holes enter the last orbits of their cosmic dance and collide. And uh, what happens is that these waves are emitted. They increase in amplitude and frequency as our black holes are in spiraling and merging so that the signal that we measure here on Earth looks something like this, what we see here in the background. So increasing in amplitude and frequency. And it sounds something like whoop. That is what we would hear if we could sonify our gravitational wave signal. So this is what we're dealing with it. Uh, with, and this really simple looking signal that we see here contains all the information that there is about our sources. So it tells us that these um, objects that produce a signal are black holes instead of neutron stars. They tell us what the mass of these objects are before they merge and after they merge. They tell us how they are rotating around each other. And uh, they also tell us about the environment that these black holes may live in. And uh, what's pertaining to my work is uh, whether or not the equations of motions are described by Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is our standard model of gravity. But there's actually a theoretical reason to believe that we may go or have to go beyond that. And with that, I already mentioned some of the puzzles that I want to solve, that I want to address using gravitational waves. So let me point out some of the mysteries that nature's, nature poses to us that we can actually answer using black holes uh, neutron stars and gravitational waves. And one of the first ones that I uh, want to point out here is actually the box on the, uh, for you, left-hand side that pertains to nuclear theory, the equation of state um, of matter under extreme gravitational conditions that we cannot assess in any other way uh, in uh, this regime, uh, in any other way but with neutron stars. And it will give us information about uh, matter um, uh, yeah, in a very unique way. And it's actually one of those fields that I haven't moved into yet, but is on my uh, list to learn for the next couple of years, because it's really exciting uh, where we can connect gravitational physics with nuclear seer with different uh, directions in physics. Another field that I've been very excited about about in recent years is that of particle physics and dark matter particle physics in particular, where you know the question is from observations, we know that about 80% of all gravitating matter is not baryonic matter, it's not the stardust that we are made of. We don't know what 80% of all matter that is gravitating is. 
Yeah, and that's and because we don't know that we call it dark matter. So for me, dark matter really means we don't know what it is. So let's give it a fancy name and try to understand it. And there's a really cool way that I will show you later on where we can use black holes to look for a class of dark matter candidates, complementary to what I know people here in the physics department are looking at um, and uh, diff different uh, observatory, if you will. And then the last one uh, up here is this big question of how can we combine gravity which describes uh, our universe on astrophysical scales with the quantum world, because uh, we have our standard models in each of them, uh, but we uh, cannot yet consistently uh, combine those. Yeah, and there are ideas, there are models of what quantum gravity might be. And if you take those models, they actually tell you that there is a modification and extensions an extension to Einstein's field equations. And I hope in the, the end of the talk, I will be able to tell you a little bit about how uh, we might be able to look for those as well using gravitational waves. Yeah, so to sum this up, we can use black holes, neutron stars, and the gravitational wave that they emit uh, during their collision to search for uh, new types of physics to connect to very different areas in physics and learn about um, our universe. Well, with all that said, let's actually uh, take a look at um, where we're standing in terms of observation. And this is really a, a selection, a best of, of what we uh, know. And the one that I want to start with is actually um, uh, observation from the Keck Observatory. And I want to take you with me to look at the center of our very own galaxy, of our Milky Way. Um, and let's look at you know, something that's about 26,000 uh, light years away from us, the center of our Milky Way. And let's look at the uh, stars moving at the center of our Milky Way. Uh, I haven't done this. This was actually uh, done by, uh, uh, among others, the uh, Keck group at UCLA, where they tracked the movement of stars around the center of our Milky Way, the center is here indicated by this white uh, star where there's actually nothing to see. But from the motion of our stars around this galactic center, we can infer the mass of this object and how compact it is. And turns out that this object here weighs about 4 million times the mass of our sun and it's actually um, was uh, one of the, well, not, if not the first, but that one of the early candidates for being a black hole, something that is extremely massive, but also extremely compact. And uh, this discovery was so important that it gave the Nobel Prize in physics in 2020 to uh, Andrea Goetz and Reinhard Genzel for the discovery of a, a black hole at the center of our galaxy. The other half of this prize went to Roger Penrose, who uh, made the prediction that uh, black holes form through stellar collapse and our natural prediction from uh, Einstein's general relativity. Well, let's stay with the center of our galaxy and let's zoom in even more. And what we get to see then is something like this. This is the shadow around uh, Sagittarius A star, so the shadow around the black hole at the center of our galaxy, measured by the Event Horizon Telescope, and the data was released uh, earlier this year. Now, what are we seeing here is the following. So we have our black hole, we have an accretion disk around the black hole, but because um, gravity, uh, the gravitational field is very strong, it's actually a curving, so the, the space time around the black hole is actually curved, and light rays follow this curvature of space time. So instead of being just going around or you know, just going uh, straight away, these light rays are bent due to the curvature from the black hole. And this is what we're seeing here. And this is why we are seeing such a ring uh, around here. And if you're interested in measurements, I think the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration is, so I think it's really impressive what they are doing because they're connecting radio uh, telescopes all across the globe to uh, get the signal and uh, uh, use interferometry, very long baseline interferometry 
to then get these images, um, for example, from the center of our galaxy. So I've been telling you now about supermassive, what we call supermassive black holes. So here we are talking about several million time, uh, mass of several million times the mass of the sun. But these are not the only types of black hole that we have in the universe. We also have black holes in our universe that are only a few times the mass of our sun. And that brings us back to the very beginning of my talk where I showed you, uh, you know, this image a little bit hidden. And I already told you that this time series signal that you can see here gives us information about our black holes that are in spiraling and merging. What we can infer from this signal is that each of these black holes had a mass of around 30 times the mass of the sun, so I think 29 and 36. It also told us that the uh, peak uh, energy, uh, so the peak flux uh, during the merger corresponded to about three solar, an energy equivalent of three solar masses. So if I translate that and say, okay, if I could harbor that energy and use it here on Earth, then it would uh, be able to power Earth or our energy consumption on Earth for the next several billion, billion, billion years. That's how much energy was released in this single event. And again, this was such an important um, breakthrough discovery that it gave the uh, Nobel Prize in 2017. And actually, I forgot to say what this abbreviation means here. GW is gravitational wave. 150914 is the date, 14th of September 2015. So the first direct detection of gravitational waves is now exactly seven years and one day old. Um, and as I said, was rewarded with the Nobel Prize in 2017 to um, Barry Barish, Kipson, and Ray Weiss, but in my mind, really for the entire uh, collaboration who made this happen, which is a um, collaboration for the Laser Interferometer Gravitation Wave Observatory, LIGO, you may have heard, um, which has about a thousand people worldwide working together. And that includes theorists like myself. Well, I'm not a member of LIGO, but people who are doing work uh, in the, along the lines that I'm doing. You have um, experimentalists, you have data scientists, you have uh, engineers working together to make this happen. Yeah. So in my mind, this is really a prize that goes to a huge collaboration uh, of people who have made uh, this possible. And actually, I want to share one thing with you that I came across recently where uh, the discovery of the LIGO um, uh, detector, so the gravitational wave discovery, was translated into Blackfoot. So Blackfoot nation is um, a native nation that uh, lives in what's nowadays Alberta in Canada and Montana here in the US. And as far as I know, this is the first announcement of a Nobel Prize winning discovery that was actually uh, translated into uh, a native language or the Blackfoot language, uh, at least. And if you're interested, I have the link here. I'm happy to share that with anyone who wants to uh, see more about this. Good. Well, let's move forward in time, two years, towards 2017. And we had, again, a breakthrough, game-changing discovery, this time of neutron stars. So we had two neutron stars that uh, have been orbiting around each other. And what happens as two objects orbit around each other in general relativity, they're actually emitting these gravitational waves that we've been talking about. So they get closer and closer together and move faster and faster, which is what we are seeing here in the first two uh, plots. So our neutron stars moving faster and faster. And what, we, uh, what they generate is, uh, again, a gravitational wave signal that increases in frequency and amplitude. Here on Earth, that signal was measured by the uh, two LIGO detectors. So LIGO is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory in uh, Hanford and Livingston. And it wasn't, was not detected by the Virgo detector in Italy. And with that information, they could actually get the localization of the source relatively accurate, well, relatively accurately. And once, so, um, what we detected with our gravitational wave detectors was actually still during this cosmic dance of our neutron stars. We didn't hear the merger, but 
Fermi, the uh, X-ray telescope, picked up a gamma ray burst. Sorry, X-ray and gamma ray a telescope picked up the a gamma ray burst, and that could be associated with the location of our binary neutron star. So we could actually re relate this new uh, or this different messenger electromagnetic radiation to our neutron star. And shortly thereafter, uh, we could observe a kilonova again associated to the signal. Um, and a uh, little meme here in the end that, of course, the LIGO uh, detections are um, kept secret. Originally, it was about four years. Now we're talking about half a year before the uh, data is publicly released. So there was an embargo on the gravitational wave detectors. But our uh, astronomy friends are releasing data, or most of them are releasing data uh, live. So people could already find out about this uh, new detection um, before the official uh, LIGO announcement. And uh, people like to talk about this event as the birth of multi-messenger astronomy. I prefer to call it the rebirth of multi-messenger astronomy because um, we are getting information from different carriers of information, in this case, um, electromagnetic radiation and gravitational waves. I say rebirth because that's actually not the first event where we have multiple messengers. So I'm thinking about the supernova 1987A, where we measured electromagnetic radiation and neutrinos, which I know um, we have ex experts here in the audience uh, as well. And of course, the dream would be to have future observations that bring all messengers also these three messengers together for that we would need a supernova that's sufficiently close to earth to um, measure uh, both the gravitational wave and the neutrino signal um, but hopefully not so close that it's dangerous for us good so where do we stand in terms of observations now and uh, this is a plot that LIGO likes to show i know this is hard to see so uh, this gives you a scale for the mass going from one solar mass down here up to 200 times the mass of the sun. And in the color coding, we have neutron stars observed with um, electromagnetic radiation. The purple ones you may not be able to see, these are black hole candidates observed with electromagnetic radiation. So for example, the very first black hole candidate that people were aware of called Cygnus X1, we actually saw um, the X-ray uh, emission from matter falling into that uh, black hole. And then here in blue, we have the uh, black hole, black hole or black hole neutron star or neutron star, neutron star detections with the LIGO detectors. We have by now about 90 such events. So we can really start uh, doing what we would call precision gravitational wave astronomy and we have a sufficiently going to have a sufficiently large number of measurements. Yeah, good. So with that said, where do we actually go in the future? Um, and for that, I brought you a bit of a timeline. And uh, starting in 2015, with the first detection uh, by LIGO, here you finally also see an image of uh, one of the LIGO detectors in Livingston. And uh, the detectors are essentially huge Michelson Morley interferometers with an L shape, and the arms are about four kilometers long. Yeah, that's what we uh, have here uh, on Earth. Um, and basically, what we're trying to do is if we uh, measure the light, laser light coming in, going off in both directions, and recombining, if there's no signal going through, then um, the end result would be a, a complete um, destructive interference, so there would be no signal. If a gravitational wave goes through, then there will be a, a shrinking of the arms in one direction and elongation in the other direction, like so, for example. And that difference will lead to a difference in the arrival time of our laser light, and that's something that we can measure. Uh, the amplitude of that signal is about relative amplitude of the signal is about 10 to the minus 22, 21, if we are really lucky. So this is really hard to measure. And I'm in awe of the you know, engineers who have made this happen. Good. So this is 2015. Um, I told you we are standing in the early 2020s now at having 90 detections of gravitational waves from black holes on neutron stars. And um, LIGO 
Virgo and Takra are expected to restart the operations early next year. Yeah, um, I think the latest that I've heard was about February, March. Um, we'll see how that uh, stands. So basically, uh, what happens is that the, LIGO, uh, the gravitational wave detectors run for a certain time, and then they are taken offline for technical, uh, technological upgrades. And now, uh, of course, there has been delayed because of the pandemic. So the hope is that they can pick up operations again um, next year. If we, when we move forward, there will be uh, in the late 2020s LIGO Voyager um, or LIGO A+. And there are also plans to build one of the LIGO detectors in India. As far as I know, the technology is already moved there and now it's the infrastructure the physical uh, uh, place that needs to be built um, and then we will have yet another uh, microphone that will be able to hear uh, or sorry another antenna that will be able to hear our gravitational wave signal and then if you move forward to the 2030s there are plans to build more sensitive detectors one of them is the einstein telescope which is a european project and cosmic explorer is something that's uh, we are trying to uh, build here in the US. At the moment, it's still in the uh, stage of uh, applying for funding and uh, see that we can make this happen. And Cosmic Explorer, the idea is to have, again, a Michelson-Morley interferometer, so this L-shape, but now with 40 kilometers arm length, which gives us really a much higher signal-to-noise ratio, much higher sensitivity. And then we're talking about being able to uh, measure hundreds to thousands of such gravitational wave events per year. And then we are really going uh, talking about doing precision gravitational wave uh, astronomy with um, those detections. And they do tell us about black holes that are uh, what we call stellar mass black holes, so few tens to a hundred times the mass of our sun. They will tell us about neutron stars. So that's remember in the beginning I said you know if we measure gravitational waves from neutron stars, from their merger, but also their post-merger, we will be able to learn about nuclear physics, uh, uh, the state of uh, matter and extreme conditions. Um, and we hope we will be able to test gravity um, with more and more precision. But this is what we will have on the ground. And this is uh, just as a, a node in frequency spectrum around 100 hertz, 100 hertz to a kilohertz. So if you sonify that, actually it's in the audible range. Now, if we want to uh, understand gravitational phenomena around supermassive black holes, for example, uh, you know, a star or a small black hole orbiting around a supermassive black hole like that at the center of our galaxy for a very long time, or if we want to measure gravitational waves from uh, the center of galaxies, so super two supermassive black holes uh, merging then the, uh, they emit gravitational waves in the millihertz regime. And for that, we need a much longer baseline. And we also are limited here on Earth by seismic noise. So there are plans for a space-based gravitational wave mission called Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, or LISA, which is illustrated here in the middle panel, where we basically will have three satellites uh, at a distance of 1.5 million kilometers. And again, we will try to see uh, the change in the distance between those satellites. And uh, at the moment, so I'm actually part of the LISA consortium and one of the co-chairs for the Waveform Working Group. And we are about two years away from actual mission adoption. So uh, the mission has already undergone review both by uh, ESA and NASA, which are the European Space Agency and the uh, uh, Space Agency here in the US. And um, we expect that the final that the mission will be adopted in two years, and then the plan is for uh, for launch is in the 2030s. Time varies a little bit early to mid 2030s is the latest uh, status. Good. And then the last one that I would like to mention are actually what we call pulsar timing arrays. So what is a pulsar? Pulsar is a neutron star that's rapidly rotating and emitting um, radio pulses. So now we are using the neutron stars that we are trying to measure with our ground-based detectors as a source or as a detector itself. And why can we do that? Because these radio pulses arrive here at Earth with extremely high precision to the point that people like to call them the most accurate clocks in the universe. So if a gravitational wave passes through, then um, 
the arrival time will change. And this is how we might um, measure gravitational waves in the nanohertz regime. So this is at even lower frequency. Um, so either individual waves or more likely actually some stochastic background where we have a superposition of, of waves. Good, so this is where we are standing um, as we go and look towards the future. So I think it's a really exciting time to be in this field. I, I feel really um, you know, uh, honored to, to be so because I did my PhD, I finished my PhD just about before the first detection and it has been such a change in the field and uh, what we can actually do now that we have these observations. And that is what I would like to tell you about next. So the uh, second half of this colloquium, I decided to tell you a little bit more about my actual own work that I'm doing in my group. And I'm showing you here an image of my group at the University of Illinois. So I have my uh, postdoc, Alexandro Dima, uh, one of my students, Freddie Pardo, Cheng Ching Cheng, uh, Chloe Richards. They are all graduate students. Healy Kogan is an undergraduate student, and Roland Haas is a colleague from the National uh, Center for Supercomputing Ac Applications for Numerical Relativity. And of course, the work that I will present here is not only done in collaboration with my uh, direct group, but also uh, with a large list of collaborators that I'm listing here. And well, all that said, what are we actually doing in my group? Well, if we have all these exciting observations coming up, how do we interpret those? I've already shown you this time series signal. Now, unlike, for example, particle measurements where you may see a bump in your spectrum and you say, oh, this is at this energy, so it's probably this kind of particle. Here, we don't have that luxury. We have noisy data where we have to pull out this uh, time series signal, and then we have to compare that time series signal to a theoretical model. So it's not that we uh, immediately know, okay, this is what the masses are, the spins are, this is where these black holes live in, it's a black hole, it's a neutron star. No, we actually have to compare two theoretical predictions or theoretical models of um, what a signal coming from a certain system may look like. And this is what I'm doing in my group and uh, where I really see that as a connection between, uh, you know, theoretical understanding and theoretical ideas to the actual observation. Now, the usual uh, steps that you need are the usual ingredients I wanted to tell you about um, and are illustrated here. So here, again, we have a picture coming from this first detection in 2015, where we show the strain, strain of, think of it as a relative amplitude of our gravitational wave, which has you, uh, uh, here is rescaled by 10 to the minus 21. So this is how small these signals are. And this is as a function of time. At the top, you see the different stages of the evolution that I will explain in a second. And then here in red, you have the uh, a model of the gravitational wave uh, signal. Now, for the, the different stages in our uh, binary evolution, we have the following. So in the beginning, our two black holes or neutron stars will be really far apart. So gravitational fields are relatively weak and velocities will be relatively slow. So in this case, you can actually use what we call post-Newtonian methods. That is, we take um, our, you can think of this as being a series expansion around Newtonian gravity that you're all familiar with in powers of the velocity of our objects, the characteristic velocity of the system. And this is great because this allows us to do analytical calculations. So it's very efficient and we can cover a large number of cycles. And what happens is that uh, because we are not in Newtonian gravity, we are actually going beyond that. We're going to Einstein. And uh, instead of having closed orbits, we actually uh, emit gravitational radiation. So it emits energy and angular momentum from our system. And uh, at, at the price of our objects getting closer and closer together. This is what we call the inspiral. Now, when these two objects are very close together, then uh, nonlinear effects that we have in Einstein's equations become important. We can no longer use this perturbative expansion and we need to use what's called numerical relativity. So we are solving Einstein's equations or extensions thereof using supercomputers. And this is what I do mostly 
for a living. Not only I also have done uh, some other work, but this is what I, most of my work uh, actually is about, to solve Einstein's equations or extensions thereof on supercomputers. And then uh, as our black holes or neutron stars merge into one and form a single final black hole, this final black hole is now rotating. It's initially highly deformed, but it sheds away uh, some of the modes that are not access symmetric. So we will have this last signal here, um, which is called the ringing down or quasi normal ring down, um, where you have an exponentially damped sinusoid of uh, your signal. And the last bit is a little bit like uh, ringing a dumbbell that then, uh, you know, uh, has a very, has a radiation or has a sound with a very characteristic frequency that depends um, on the uh, on the bell uh, on the properties of the bell itself, but it dies down. So it's also an exponentially damped uh, sinusoid. Good, and uh, we need to bring all of these techniques together to then create a complete um, template or uh, model that covers the in spiral merger and the ring down. I'm not going to go into any of the details of which versions they are, but I'm happy to talk about this uh, later on. But the message that I want you to take away from this is that we need these full inspire merger ring down models to then really interpret our signals, to uh, extract the wealth of information that I told you is uh, hidden in the signal. Yeah. And um, what I want to show you uh, today is some of the work that we've been doing in my group where we have actually used um, black holes to learn about particle physics and in particular about some dark matter candidates. Um, and we are using uh, our work or we're developing the infrastructure and then uh, using our work to test gravity in the strong field uh, that unfolds as our black holes collide. Let me start with the first one. And uh, let me talk about this uh, whole question about dark matter a little bit more, because there, well, there are several observations that hint at the existence of this additional form of matter that we don't know what it is. But we know um, from observations that it must be there. So the first observation that I have here is on the left. And again, it's uh, having gravity acting like a lens. So gravity, a strong gravitational field deflecting light coming in this case uh, from galaxies behind um, the object that is actually deflecting the light. And in this case, we were lucky enough for the universe to smile at us and uh, show us this pretty image here, um, which is uh, gravitational lensing. The other measurement that I wanted to mention is that of what we call galactic rotation curve. So if you look at the galaxy, and we say, okay, how fast are particle moving, particles moving? And let's take uh, only the matter that we can observe. And I, by that, I mean, you know, observe in all kinds of uh, electromagnetic radi uh, radiation, uh, baryonic matter, the, the type of matter that we are also made of, ordinary matter. Well, if you do that, and you would expect that the velocity would be, uh, would have a peak at some point and then die off as you go further and further out of the galaxy. What is measured instead is this yellow curve here where you have your peak, but then the velocity stays almost constant as if there is an additional mass, additional matter that causes um, this different uh, behavior of the velocity. And uh, again, these are observational indications that there is stuff out there that we don't know it's um, about 26% of all the energy in the universe, or as I said before, 80% of all matter that gravitates. Yeah. So this is a, big, a pretty huge question. For comparison, the ordinary matter that we are made of makes up about 5% of the energy batteries, give or take, maybe 6%, but really rather little um, of what we have in our universe. So it's a really maybe interesting question to understand what dark matter might be. And of course, there are many different ideas floating around. I decided to bring you a little bit of a funny one from uh, XKCD comics, where they show you know, dark matter candidates all the way from uh, microelectron volts to the, uh, up here 10 to the 30 kilograms is like the mass of the sun. And there are 
a large number of candidates out there. Uh, the WIMP uh, was one um, popular one. They suggest space cows. Well, it's probably not space cows. Um, and one of the uh, candidates that I'm particularly excited about is what's listed up down here. They're called axions, are axion like particles. I know you have the expert here um, at uh, ASU. But why do I care about these? Because they are predictions from particle physics. And um, there is the idea that axion like particles may actually span a large range in masses. And there is a piece in this mass range where I can use black holes to look for these kind of beyond standard model particles. And this I think is really cool. So you use gravity and black holes to do particle physics. So and as like a catchphrase, right? Um, but how do I do this? Well, there is a mechanism that is called superradiance or superradiant instability. What is that? Well, uh, let me start with an, an analogy before I talk about black holes. So take, for example, your, I don't know, bike or car and uh, go to a uh, pebbly road. And if you're very unlucky, you may get stuck and you try to, you know, give more energy into your rotation. Uh, and instead of getting out, what happens is that you're actually transferring energy to these pebbles. So they're coming to spill out. Well, something similar happens to our black holes. So we may have a rotating black hole and we may want to throw particles at it. And if these particles have a sufficiently small frequency, then instead of being absorbed uh, by the black hole, they actually are scattered off with a larger energy and larger angular momentum. And this is what is called uh, black hole superradiance. Um, and if these fields are massive, they uh, we can become trapped around our black hole and form what we call a condensate or cloud of uh, scalar fields, or um, more generally, if you have uh, bosonic fields. Now this effect, um building up a cloud of light particles um, is particularly effective when the Compton wavelength of your field is comparable to the size of the black hole. Well, what does it actually translate to? Well, let me tell you. So if I have a, uh, let me start here on the right-hand side. So let's read backwards. So if I take a stellar mass black hole, so the ones that I can measure with LIGO, for example, then I would be sensitive to fields that have an energy, mass energy of about 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 9 electron volts. So here we are getting close to probing the QCD axon. Then, oh, this is a little outdated. If we talk about LISA, remember the laser interferometer space antenna that I mentioned to you, where we uh, want to look for black holes in the range of 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7 um, solar masses, we would probe for particles in the regime 10 to the minus 17 electron volts. And if we go to even uh, higher uh, black hole masses, something like 10 to the 10 or 10 to the uh, 9 solar masses, we would be probing fields in the range of 10 to the minus 20, 10 to the minus 21 electron volts. And in this regime, uh, these particles have actually become uh, somewhat popular as dark, certain dark matter candidates. Um, so uh, what I want to say is that, uh, that we can use black holes to try and search for these axion-like particles. Some of them are interesting as dark matter candidates, but we are actually probing a much larger range of these beyond standard model particles. Yeah, And uh, what we really only need here is a coupling, gravitational coupling between our new field, our new particle, and gravity. So we are not relying on any coupling to the standard model of particle physics or anything else. So this is really a gravitational probe for new particles, which I find really cool. Um, <laughs> and there has been, as you can see on my long um, reference list here, there has been a lot of work on this topic. And it has really picked up about 10 years ago when people realized that we could use black holes to probe for these fields. Now, one of the things that I'm interested in uh, in my group is actually not just a single black hole, but uh, a binary thereof. And let's assume that uh, we may be in a region where we have an over density of, say, dark matter or of these particles that may have grown through superradiance. Well, what 
happened in this case uh, and what is a signature well let me tell you because i uh, can show you a work in progress this is relatively fresh out of the computer um, and was led by my students Cheng 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 and uh, giuseppe ficara who is just finishing his phd next month um, and here we simulated two black holes orbiting around each other in this case it's a rather short simulation because we that was really the first uh, proof of principle that uh, our code is uh, giving a reasonable results and um, we coupled that to these massive scalar fields and included the back reaction there so um, the code that i'm using is called canuda it's a code that i have been uh, developing in my group it's open source and uh, is able to do these kind of calculations for extra fields it also does simulations for um, series beyond einstein's general relativity and it is coupled to the Einstein toolkit for which I'm one of the co-PIs, which is a, a really open source um, numerical relativity code for computational astrophysics, which has been developed for the last at least 10 years. The precursors actually uh, are older than that. Good. So what have we found? Well, let me first show you an animation here of the scalar fields that we have evolved. And what you let me just stop for a second so that I can explain what you're seeing here. So you have the X, Y plane. So think of it as the equatorial plane in which my black holes are moving. And uh, here, these highlighted centers is actually where the scalar field has been accreted onto the black hole. So it takes this as a primer of where the black holes are. And the color coding is uh, an indication for the amplitude of our scalar field. So what we can see here is that uh, the scalar field is actually uh, kind of accreted onto our black holes and is now orbiting with the black holes. And just like oscillating charges, they emit uh, scalar dipole radiation. So we form these kind of scalar condensates and uh, during their in spiral, they generate scalar dipole radiation. Good. Yeah, and that you can uh, see. Uh, being emitted here. But let me just uh, finish the uh, animation because now the next question that you may want to ask is that, you know, if I generate the scalar dipole radiation, um, what does it actually do to my binary? Because now this, this radiation will carry energy away from my system. Does it change my gravitation wave signal? And um, let me just stop here because this is just a long after merger uh, evolution. And let me show you instead the gravitational wave, oops, sorry, the gravitational wave signal that we get. And now here, let me just explain my units because I'm using units that are common in numerical relativity where we have here on the left, our um, measure for the gravitational wave signal for the experts in the audience we're measuring the uh, quadrupole mode of the newman penrose scalar psi four rescaled by the radius at where we measure uh, our signal so for everyone else think of this as a measure for the gravitational wave amplitude as a function of time and now the units that we are using are actually uh, the units of the total mass of our system so this is something that we are allowed to do and uh, it's rather convenient. So this is uh, depending on what the mass of our black hole system is, we can then translate into uh, SI units. And what you see here in green, so the solid curve is the gravitational wave signal that you would get from a black hole. So two uh, black holes with the same mass, no spin for the last three orbits. Um, and this is the gravitational wave signal that you would get from those. And now enter this additional scalar field. And what you can see is that now the uh, frequency increases. Um, so what's happening is that with the dissipation of our scalar radiation, our uh, in spiral is accelerated. So we have um, a larger orbital angular momentum, orbital frequency. And that directly translates into our gravitational wave frequency. So this is what we are seeing here. So we get a phase shift in the gravitational wave signal um, due to that. And I guess uh, in terms of 
time. I see we have 10 minutes left. Yeah, exactly. So that's what I'm thinking. So I think I will actually skip the last part um, and actually really rather take that time for questions. And then if anyone's interested, I would be happy to talk about simulations and extensions of Einstein's theory of gravity. But I think in the interest of time, I will just uh, go over this. Yeah, because it wouldn't be able to do this in 10 minutes unless you really want to quick run through. So let me uh, instead just um, summarize that I could hopefully convince you that there's a really exciting um, future ahead of us in terms of gravitational wave measurements, precision gravitational wave measurements, and the physics that we can do with it. So we have a really new discovery space now to learn about uh, cosmology, particle or astroparticle physics. Um, what I didn't show you is, you know, going towards quantum gravity, going towards nuclear theory. And in order to do that, we need accurate uh, models of the n-spiral merger and ring down of the expected gravitational wave signal, both in general relativity and if we want to test uh, that in extensions of general relativity. Um, I haven't talked too much about the status of numerical relativity, but we are now at the stage where we have the first proof of principal simulations available. So it's, you know, counting probably a, a one or two handful so now we can really go towards building um, catalogs of such waveforms and then um, do parameter estimation, try to uh, identify maybe beyond uh, signals of deviations from our standard model in our observations. So this is what would be coming next. Um, and with that, I would like to thank all of you for your attention and I will take your questions.